welcome to Martin County High School. Um, can you introduce yourself to sure. us? Sure. My name is William Penn, P-E-N-N. -N. Um, Marine, United States Marine Corps. I was a sergeant. And, um, go ahead. Okay, well, in the, here, you said that you wanted as soon as when you were 13. Correct. When I was, I first wanted the taste of the Marine Corps when I was 13 years old. And that, that's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I just wanted to get out of high school and graduate naturally. <laughs> and then uh, join the Marine Corps. But I wasn't able to join as soon as I got out of high school because I wasn't 18 and my parents wouldn't sign for me. So I had to wait until October when I was October the 2nd. And I was in on October the 3rd. I was in the Marine Corps. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I mean, you got what you wanted, but do you respect your parents for not wanting you to join? Absolutely, the absolutely. It was just, there was a, um, the Korean conflict was right before I went in. It was just simmering down when I joined. And, um, I had two sisters and I was the only son and um, naturally my parents didn't want me to go because there was a lot of you know there was a lot of blood and a lot of loss of life in that conflict well, of course they wanted you to be safe right exactly but you know being 18 years old you're, you're you know completely indestructible oh yeah yeah you are so when yeah. you actually went into the Marines yes you said you mentioned before that you um, had eight weeks of training. Was it? Or? Yes. Well, the first thing when you when you enter the Marine Corps, when you join the Marine Corps, then um, you go to basic training, and on the East Coast, from the Mississippi River over to the East Coast, those Marines that join, they go to South Carolina, to Paris Island which is the Marine Corps Recruit, recruit Depot. Same. And that's Paris Island, South Carolina. And when you go there, you spend um, 12 weeks for basic training. That takes you from being a civilian to smacking you around and then <laughs> making a Marine out of you. <laughs> and then when you get finished with your um, 12 weeks of basic training, they teach you all the basics. They teach you basic combat situations, um, the we all rep weaponry at that time. In the fifth, this was in 1954, October 1954 is when I went in, yes. and um, they they teach you everything. You go through all the bayonet training and the grenade, all that other stuff. And then when, once you complete the 12 weeks, if you're if you're able to complete it and graduate and earn your Eagle, Eagle Globe and Anchor, uh -huh. that's what you earn, then you're Marine. Up until that time, you're just a recruit. I see. Um, when you entered the Marines, yes. and you were finally a Marine, what jobs did you carry out when you were there? Like well, after the basic training of 12 weeks, then you get a short stay of uh, like five or seven days where you can go home or do whatever you want. You're on, you know, you don't have to report to your next duty station for those, I think it was seven days. And then you go to, automatically you go to combat training. And the combat training takes place in North Carolina at a camp called Lejeune, Camp Lejeune. And within Camp Lejeune, there's another camp called Camp Geiger. And that's where you take your four weeks of uh, combat training. That's with flamethrowers and all this other things that they teach you there. And then you um, go to your designated, what they call your MOS. My MOS was uh, 6431, which was electrician and the aviation electrician. Before that, you're a basic rifleman, which is an 0300. So after you complete your combat training, because every Marine, the first thing is they're a rifleman. Whether you're a cook, a helicopter electrician, no matter what you are, you're a rifleman. And if they need riflemen, they can grab a cook and he can do the job also. And 
after that combat training, then you go to your specific school or area of uh, what they want, where they want you to place you. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to get um, selected to go to California, <laughs> which was El, El Toro, California. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I'm sorry, I got to back up. I had to go okay. to I had to go to Florida first after combat training because I took four and 22, 28 weeks of electricians training for aviation electricians. Wow. So and that was in weeks. Jacksonville, Florida. Then I went to El Toro. I'm sorry, I misled you a little bit. Oh, that's okay. Then uh, I went to they're both oh. sunny places, so. <laughs> oh yeah, we oh yeah. In California both. was great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there, I I got assigned to my helicopter unit, which was uh, in the Third Marine Air Wing. Yes. And that's was my. That's where I stayed the whole time. And in between that time is when I went down to the South Pacific on some special mission. And what special mission was that? Well, during the, the I was in the, it was in 1956. In 1956, in the beginning of the year, it was around February, the Atomic Energy Commission was doing testing of their atomic weaponry mm -hmm. in this um, south, it's really not the South Pacific, but it's almost the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. It's in an area called um, the Kwajalein area, Bikini Atoll in that specific area. Mm -hmm. And they were testing their uh, atomic weaponry, which they had. And so in, in February of 1956, our, our uh, helicopter squadron, which was what I was in, was selected to go down and be on that island for transporting the um, and support of the Atomic Energy Commission, the scientists and all. So your the job there was to basically fix the helicopters and stuff like that in order for the scientists to be able to test their atomic uh, Correct. Yeah. In other words, if 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 one of the the, uh, the helicopters, if uh, something electrical was wrong with it or whatever, they had a problem, then that's where I would come in. How many bombs occurred during the time that you stayed? I area? would I would think we were there from from February to July, and uh, I, I think the, the testing actually started in I think the, in mid early to mid June. Mm -hmm. is when they, you know, the testing started. And the test, um, the operation was called Red Wing. Operation Red Wing. Uh -huh. That was the, I think there was um, 15, 10 or 15 atomic energy um, explosions, tests. That's uh, quite, a, quite that, a few. Excuse me? I said that's quite a few. That was quite a few. Uh -huh. We were able to... Um, Observe one, which was a uh, the first hydrogen bomb dropped from a plane. All the rest of them, the, the tests were either surface or subsurface, which would be below water, mm -hmm. or they would be on a barge. So this was the only one, and uh, first and last one that you have ever seen. Yes, it was only one, but it was uh, awesome. Can you explain it to Oh, us? sure. Um, when we were, we had our, uh, the uh, Navy, which our helicopters are on a Navy carrier, okay? Mm -hmm. We had some on the carrier and we had some on this little island called Enyu Island. And we got our orders to go back on ship, the helicopters, and we were going out, we were told that we were gonna go out about, I'm gonna say 20 miles or whatever it was, away from where the ground zero, what they call ground zero, where the blast is gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, we were told to go and get on the carrier and they were gonna go out. And, okay, you know, we were gonna go and we were out 20 miles away or whatever. 
and they said, okay, we're gonna, you're gonna witness the first airdrop of a hydrogen bomb. And we all went, oh my God, you know, wow. Because everything was atomic at that point in time. Yeah. So they said that we're a good ways away. They wouldn't tell us how far. We'll get some about 20, 30 miles. And um, it was pr approximately 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. at that time. They told us we could go up on our flight deck from we were down below. They could go up on the flight deck, mm -hmm. which is the you know what a carrier looks like, and that's the flight deck, that big long area. Yeah. We were allowed to go up there, and they said, okay, we're going. You're going to be able to witness this. So. They um, told most of the um, atomic energy, all of the atomic energy people and all of the um, upper officers, they had special goggles that they could actually watch the blast without, you know, with their back to it or whatever. But they told us that we needed to have our, bla our, our back facing the blast and we had utilities, you know, Marine Corps utilities on, and we had to put that, uh, our, our cover, what they call a cover is a hat, and crook that up in your arm, and then put your arm over your eyes, and close your eyes. So I'm guessing that wasn't a lot of protection. Uh, no, not, not really, <laughs> even my arm, because I, when the initial blast went off, they said, after the initial blast happens, we're going to let you turn around. We'll tell you when. You can turn around and you could observe the, uh, the cloud, the mushroom cloud. When it blasted uh, and your backs were turned, did you, could you tell that it happened? Oh, yeah. I seen right through my arm. Wow. I could see the light right through my arm, through my hat, through my cover, everything. You, and then uh, I would say it was probably 10 seconds or maybe more in, in, that, partic in that area. Yeah. Then they told us we could turn around and watch the, the mushroom develop. And how was that? That was awesome, awesome. It, it was the color, uh, you say it's awesome, but the color was unbelievable. You know, from, from bright white to yellow to darker orange to a purple. I mean, it was just a, an awesome color. So and then mm -hmm. about, I'm gonna say a minute or two, then you got the concussion of the of the the blast, which it, I mean it didn't like you know it wasn't like real loud or anything, but mm -hmm. you could hear the boom like that the concussion. I see. But um, it, it was it was an awesome sight. Was so the see? was the concussion very forceful? Like not really, no. But you knew it happened. Right. You knew that you know you knew that it happened. Hmm. Would you say that the scientists uh, did a good job on the fir their first try of a hydrogen bomb? Well, or? I think they did a good job because it blew up. Yeah. <laughs> but it blew up about you know, four miles away from, from where it was supposed to blow up. Oh. I think it was about four miles. I'm, I'm guessing on that. It's, it was in the range of two to four miles that oh. it was off target. Oh, it's... Um, Good that it wasn't close to you guys. Good that it wasn't 20 miles off target. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it still had its effects to your friends, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it did what it was supposed to do, even though it wasn't exactly pinpointed to where they wanted it to happen. But it, the, it was effective, and it did what they wanted it to do, the blast. So do you think you were one of the top men in your uh, squad? Or would you be modest and say that everyone was... I would be modest. Okay. We were all, you know, we were all there. Okay. I, I mean, we do, we do have rank. Like, I, I was, uh, at that point in time, I was just about ready to make corporal, I think. I was a PFC, mm. and I was about ready to make corporal. And um, then, um, you know, everybody had a rank. You had sergeants, you had... Staff sergeants, master sergeants, lieutenants, colonels, captains, whatever. But we're all, you know, doing what we had to do. Um, is there... I was wondering, did you stay in touch with your family at all? Was it easy to stay in touch? 
It was. We were allowed to have mail back and forth, but we weren't allowed to have any radios or, or um, no cameras. We couldn't mm -hmm. have a camera, so we really couldn't take any pictures of us, you know, yeah. getting drunk or whatever. <laughs> 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 because we did do that. <laughs> <laughs> So what That's about a little side story I can tell you later. <laughs> oh well you can tell us now. Well they had a, on the island the Atomic Energy Commission had their area and they had a mess hall and everything. Then they had a place called the Snake Pit. And the Snake Pit was where you went for beer and whatever. And there were times when they would take us off to they would let us go over to the island, if you weren't already mm -hmm. on the island, mm -hmm. they would let you leave the carrier and you'd go by the, by the, like the Higgins boat. That's the boat that you see where the front drops down and the guys run out of it, you know. And you could go over to the island and that, and everybody would get on and you'd go over and sailors and marines and we'd all, you know, how you doing, how's everything, everything is fine. You go over there and you get blasted and then on the <laughs> way back, there was fights. <laughs> the Navy was fighting the Marines. The Marines were fighting the Navy. All friendly stuff, though, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of friendly. So <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, you know. So you never, nothing ever serious happened? No. And none of you guys were ever? No. No uh, grudges held to the stand? No, no, no. no, no, no. Um, what about medals? Citations? Can I had, well... I should say when I was in when I was taking my boot camp when I first went in the 12 weeks in our platoon there were three PFC stripes to be awarded at the end of the graduation and there was one uh, honor man uh, was going to be named so that's four awards that we're going to you know were allowed for that platoon our platoon and um, the drill instructor said that the platoon could vote who they wanted the stripe to go to or the honor man to go to. And now I'm not going to be modest. <laughs> the platoon voted for me for PFC and for honor man, but they couldn't do that because you had four and there had to be four Marines. Huh. You couldn't, you know, could give one Marine two awards. You couldn't do that. So the drill instructor told me. You know, the platoon voted for you, honor man certificate or a PFC stripe. He says, if I was you, I'd take the PFC stripe. I said, well, he says, it's more money. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was lucky enough at a boot camp to make that uh, PFC stripe. I was only one of three people to make that. And oh. then uh, I got the permanent meritorious corp corporal uh, in it was in 1956, later 1956, and then in 1957, before I got out, I made sergeant. And the only medals that I really had, I had three ribbons, one's in question that I have to get answered. But you get the Good Conduct Medal, and you get the um, uh, National Defense Ribbon, and I got a Sharpshooter's Medal, which is next to the highest medal that you could get for accuracy when you're firing a uh, rifle. So you would say you were good with guns? I, w I was fair. I was fair, yeah. What model were they using at the M1. time? M1. M1, yeah. Gotcha. Great and weapon. Um, <laughs> great weapon. Heavy, but great weapon. Do you remember the specific electronics inside the helicopters that you were working with? Um, like if they had there was automatic a helicopter. pilot, but they were rudimentary compared to today. Right. Really, I mean, it was like uh, you know, little little black boxes here and there, you know, for the automatic pilot and whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, it's much more sophisticated. Right. right. Much more. So the, even the training that we took was, you know, just what we needed at that point in time. I went to a couple of schools for um, different kind of uh, equipment that they were going to upgrade to, but yeah. nothing like today, nothing. They were, they were basic. Wow. Well, um, we, uh, we know you've probably made quite a few friends in the Marines. Yes, I did. Um, do you still t stay in touch with them today? There's a few. There's a few that we still email back and forth. 
and they have reunions every other year. And uh, I didn't make the last one. Um, our detachment, or, or the Marine Corps League, had their uh, national convention, which I'm a part of the Marine Corps League now. Mm -hmm. And they had a national convention about the same time as the uh, reunion was going to take place. So I couldn't go to the reunion. So I went mm -hmm. to the, you know, national convention. I see. So, um, uh, what but about... But I still think it's staying in touch. We still e email each other. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Any phone calls or anything like that? Not really. They used to be, but that's kind of dwindled away. Yeah, just... But we still, we still email... And and I email two, and they email two or three, and then mm -hmm. they'll email, and they'll ask, did you see anybody or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they have, uh, one guy keeps a website where he has all the reunion pictures, you know, of all the guy You never recognize anybody, you know. Well, what about out of, uh, after the war? Did you start up a family or anything after? And after I got out, after yeah. I was released, See, when I went in, you had, to, you had to obligate yourself for eight years when you joined. Mm -hmm. you know, eight years of obligated service. Three of it was active and five of it I was assigned to a reserve unit. And during that time, after I got released, which is in nine, October of 1957, I went to, um, I joined the uh, IBEW, which is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And I went to that school at, that was six weeks, almost, no, six years. It was six years of schooling because I messed up one year because I had I was in a hospital. Mm. Uh, so well, what were you in the hospital for? Appendix. Oh. Appendicitis. I'm sorry. So I had to go back and redo. So, but it was a five-year course. So during that five years, which I was in the ready reserve, and during that five years, they kept in touch to see if my grades were okay and if I was doing okay because if not they were able to drag me back in because Vietnam was just starting to cook. Um, so. When you, uh, your eight years were up and you left, do, were you upset about leaving or were you happy to start? Looking back on it, I wish I would have stayed in, but at the time I was happy to get out. Well, yeah, because you've been in the same place for so long. Right. And You've been away from the world, well, actually yeah, hanging out with from your family and everybody, you yeah. know. Um, when you got back, would, did anything change between your family? How, like, the age of your sisters and everything, were they married? Oh, um, yeah, my sisters were married and, you know, we had, uh, I think they, they each had two children. Oh. At the time, young, young little, little, you know, buggers yeah. running around. Yeah. And um, I didn't get married until, oh, I guess I was 26. Oh, that's so young. So I got out when I was 21 mm -hmm. and um, went to school and met my wife that I married to today. Yeah. So we've been married since 63. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you How big is my medal? <laughs> <laughs> Not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hers is bigger than mine, though. No. <laughs> um, so, did you have any sons or daughters with her? Yes, I have two sons in New Jersey. One is a uh, a guitar buff. He has. I'll give you a card, though. You, if you're into music at all, which I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. He has a website, and um, my other son is an electrician, followed in my footsteps. Mm -hmm. They both are, went to school for electrician work, and then, um, and, and, uh, but my older son went to the music, and, and my younger son stayed with the electrical business. He's mm -hmm. still doing it. I noticed some pictures in your lab. Can you show us them and tell sure. us where they are? Sure. I can start with... Uh, this one, that's when I was in boot camp. I was 18 years old. Wow. Everybody gets a picture taken when they're there <laughs> in dress blues. Oh, I should say, when we graduated from boot camp, we were one of the first platoons to graduate with dress blues. 
most others graduated in their either greens or their tropicals. And uh, why were you one that... That's when I was out in California, just... Hmm. That's boot camp. That's some of the guys that I was in boot camp with. Uh, were they one of your close friends? Do you talk to no. any of them no. today? No. You, you were trained with them though? Yes. Gotcha. And this is our graduation picture. And that's that heavy weapon you were talking about earlier. In all of oh, the M1. Yeah. Yep. The M1. Yeah, great weapon. And the Browning Automatic, the BAR, was a great weapon. Hmm. So in that picture was... Uh, that's when we graduated yeah. boot camp in Paris Island. Well, I see. And this is uh, uh, some of the guys that I attended uh, uh, school in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh. Some of the Navy guys. And then this is the same place, Jacksonville, Florida. They all seem very happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know. This is the, um, the squadron, the helicopter squadron. Those were all the uh, enlisted, enlisted Marines. That's not the officers or anybody like that. It's just... And that's our picture of one of our helicopters. Like I say, it's, it's one of the older ones and, it's, you know, yeah. basic. Did you see any of the um, improvements in helicopter technology? Well, yeah, if, if you go to the, like, at the um, air show they just had, mm -hmm. they had a couple of the newer models there. Right. I walked in one where you could put that inside of it. Wow. Yeah, really. Hmm. And oh, the larger okay. picked out so one right yeah. there on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier was with the enlisted men and the officers from our squadron. And there's a couple pictures of the the um, blast right. of one of the, I don't know what shot that was, but that's that's an atomic blast. Right. And you, this is not the one that no. you were allowed to see. Because no, it's you just a couple of snapshots that I've seen on this on online. Right. And I figured I'd bring them in to show you. Right. And that's that's the pictures that I brought. Well, I do have another. Uh, I have a map, if you're interested, in the uh, actual islands. This is the Bikini Atoll. This is the Bikini Atoll. And on that map are the different blasts that took place. They're all Indian names, American Indian names. Mm -hmm. Right. You can see that, every one of them. Yeah. And um, Inu Island, I believe, is down here. This is where our little hangar was for the helicopters, little for repairs. And this is out here is where all the shots took place. So... And this is the one, this is the one that was supposed to be here, but it was there. <laughs> now, um, what would you estimate the megaton of the bomb that you actually witnessed was? I would say it was about four, about four megatons, right. the hydrogen blast. So, and that was the largest one. That was the largest blast out of the, uh, oh, between 12 and 15 blasts that took place right. while we were down there. But we only were allowed, you know, us, we were only allowed to witness the one that I had told you about, the hydrogen blast. Right. But I, um, the other blasts that took place, our helicopters were used to go out over the areas where the blasts occurred. They took the Atomic Energy Commission guys, the scientists, whatever you want to call them, took them out so that they could review and observe exactly what happened afterwards. And this was at the, um, close, the closing of the Korean War. This was after the, right, just yeah. when the Korean War got finished, then the, the blasts were going on, yeah. Since you weren't actually involved with the Korean War, like, fighting? No, um, was not. What did you think about the Korean conflict, though? Did you feel that... 
the U.S. should have been involved? Or? It's, it's hard to say at that point in time. I, I couldn't even, I don't know. So you have no opinion on the matter of why they were involved with Korea? Not really, no. Oh. Mm. That's too bad. I still wanted to join the Marines just to be in. I still, yeah, I still yeah, wanted to join, sure. Just be awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. And we, uh, I, should, I should interject that <clears throat> during the time that all these blasts were happening and our helicopters were going out and looking at all the different blast areas, when they took the scientists out and when they came back to the island, they were, I brought them in. I was on a de what they call a decontamination team. Yeah. And we, de we had to decontaminate the helicopter after it came back. How did you decontaminate it? Well, the first thing you had to do was set them down, let them guys get out, let them go and do what they had to do to the atomic unit. We didn't get to rub elbows with the Atomic Energy Commission people, the scientists. But we would bring them in, set them down, the helicopter, and then I took the Geiger counter up to the helicopter and I would measure the radiation, if any, or whatever, inside, outside the wheels, if they touch down, maybe they touch down in a certain area after a blast. And if the, if the plane was, the helicopter was too hot, to, in other words, it was full of radiation, then I told everybody, just stay back and we'll just let it cool down one hour, two hours, four hours, whatever. And I would check it every once in a while. And when it was in a reasonable amount, had, you know, uh, decayed, so to speak, then we would go in, put on our, we had mechanics coveralls, rubber boots and rubber gloves. Well, we didn't have the say. silver suits with the silver helmets and the silver boots and all the gloves and all that kind of stuff. We didn't have any of that. We just had coveralls, boots, and gloves. And we washed the plane down, scrubbed it with scrub brushes and soap and water. And wow. that was it. So would you say the protection and cleansing would be insufficient towards what actually happens? At that point in time, they felt that that was, that was okay at that point in time. But looking back on it and knowing more about the radiation and the atomic effects, you know, the effects of radiation, on people and things, that probably it wasn't, you know, it probably wasn't uh, a, enough of protection. Do you know anyone that has been affected by radiation? Well, I know that two, I know of two, <coughs> excuse me, two of the Marines that were down there at the, at the same time I was, they have passed away from cancer. Now, uh, people are dying from cancer today, and mm -hmm. they were dying you know, not even knowing where that place was at. So, was it from the effects of the radiation? Perhaps. Their wives think it was. Mm -hmm. Because that's their wives, you know, and their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But can you actually say it was their fault? No. Uh, chances are it probably was, but who knows, you know? Right. It could, it could be coincidental, but you do not know. Yeah, but... Mm, yeah. I kind of think it was from that, but that's yeah. just my own personal opinion. Right. Were they more in touch with the helicopters of radiation than you, or would you say that you had more? No, I would say that uh, the decontamination team varied with different, different guys. I remember, I can remember two guys in particular, but I don't know if they're alive or dead or not, I lost touch with them. Oh. But the other ones, I don't remember if they were on the decon team or not. I was for as many times as I was on the island. Because I was on the carrier also, so I had to be on there, you know, and, and on the island at different times. I see. You said you used the Geiger counter to go up to yes. it and measure radi radiation? Right. Were there any other uh, men that did that with you, or were, did you go up alone and... No, that. I did it by myself. So I went up by myself. Would you consider that that you were at higher risk of radiation? Probably. Then, then the decontamination team members, right. yes. Because you were yes. going up below, still hot. Right. 
Now, the, uh, I don't know whatever happened to the officers that flew the plane, the helicopter. Right. Or what happened to the uh, scientists, you know, from the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission. I don't know if they ever, you know, got any kind of blood problems. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Hmm. But um, fortunately, um, I'm 73, so I'm, I, I think I'm out of the woods. Yeah. I hope I'm out of the woods with that anyway. <laughs> yeah. Most likely. I think so. How did you readjust when you got back home from the Marines? I was 21 years old, and <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> I adjusted pretty good. Any life lessons, though, that you've learned from going into the military? Yeah, I, th I think it, it, I would recommend the military to anybody. Hmm. I really would. Not because of the shooting and the, all of that, but I think it, it just, I don't know, you, you just, you're different. You know, you just come out differently. You have a different outlook on life. You, you, you mature much more faster. Is that a good word? Much more faster? Much more quickly, okay. I think. Yeah. But more quickly, yeah, you do. You really do. So I you mean, would say that it was a life-changing experience to join the war? Yeah. Wow. I would think so. That sounds pretty interesting, but I think we should wrap it up. Okay. It's been quite a while. We got a lot of information. It's and been nice talking to you. Well, thank you very much for the, the opportunity well, to share that with you. Well, thank you for explaining what happened and you may actually help other people decide on whether to join the war because i mean it sounds really interesting i recommend it highly oh, yeah. let me put it that way yeah. well thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you.